Creation Revisited. We've been discussing uh, the Genesis account of origins, uh, the Genesis creation account and its reverberations in the Old Testament, and he spoke and it was divine creation in the Old Testament. Basically, two books with the same uh, outlook, the latter one being a uh, uh, somewhat uh, popularized version of the first. Um, there's the cover for both of them. Uh, they are also available uh, on Kindle, at least, um, the Genesis account. Uh, and we're been going to be discussing Chapter 4, which is entitled Creation Revisited, Echoes of Genesis 1 and 2 in the Pentateuch, which is, of course, why uh, we titled our talk today, Creation Revisited. It's by Paul Greger, Ph.D. from Andrews University. And it begins... This study will examine several key terms used in the Pentateuch outside of Genesis 1 and 2. Ones also used are connected to the creation account. The use of these key terms will help us to better understand certain aspects of creation terminology and, where possible, demonstrate its structure and theology. So we're being a little bit redirected from just uh, where you have echoes, um, where you have references to the creation account to looking at the terminology that's used in the creation account and where it uh, comes out in Genesis 1 and 2. In this study, I will not follow a chronological order in the discussion of the Pentateuchal creation language, but rather the sequence is based on the relative importance and impacts that the reused terms had. Ultimately, is hoped that a better understanding of creation terminology in the Pentateuch will enhance our comprehension of the creation account of Genesis 1 and 2 itself. Creation language in the fourth commandment, we're starting out with the most obvious parallel. Apart from Genesis 1 and 2, creation language is most concentrated in the fourth commandment, especially in the one recorded in Exodus 28 through 11. Uh, I might say nearly exclusively in Exodus 28 through 11, the Deuteronomy 5 uh, account, of course, is famous for not mentioning creation. The first three verses, verses 8 through 10, emphasize the command about the seventh day, but the last verse is linked to the first part by a causative clause starting with key. Um, therefore, is probably a good way of... Uh, um, uh, because, uh, indicating the reason for such a demand. It refers to the creation week when everything was created in six days and on the seventh day God rested in Exodus 20, verse 11. The author employed the verb asa, to make, uh, which is in harmony with the creation story recorded in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. The same verb is used for the first time during the second day of creation, Genesis 1, 7, in relationship to the creation of the firmament, uh, rakia. And that's Asa. The same uh, was named Shemayim, the heavens, and it is probable that the fourth commandment in Exodus 20:11 is referring to these heavens rather than to the ones in Genesis 1:1, 1, 1, which may point to the entire universe. You may remember that uh, Davidson made a similar point. Nuah, to rest. And for those of you who are interested, the word Noah is actually derived from that. Uh, it seems that the vocabulary in Exodus 20, 11 corresponds to the creation account in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, with one exception. While the, rest of the, while the Genesis account employs the word Shabbat, to rest, the Exodus account uses Nuah. This verb will be discussed further in connection with Genesis 2.15, so there's another section coming. Here in Exodus 20.11, it appear, appears in the call form, the simple form. And is, it, is therefore, it therefore has meaning different from that, from and I think that somebody missed an uh, editorially uh, clipped one of those two. Probably should have been clipped. Uh, the then should have been clipped. Uh, it's in the original. I checked. Um, it's hifil form. 
in Genesis 2.15, or the causative form. He will cause to have something happen. This verb is used in the call form only 30 times in the Old Testament and is mostly employed in theological contexts, even though secular contexts are possible. Its subject may vary from things such as Noah's Ark, which rested, which is kind of funny, Noah's Ark, Noahed. Um, and the Ark of the Covenant, insects, animals, and birds, and humans, to abstract objects such as justice, death, and the spirit. And you'll notice that now he's gone beyond the Pentateuch to uh, take some of the other Old Testament references. Um, God's, gift, God's gift given to the human race is nuah in Isaiah 25.10 and 57.2. In these contexts, the verb is to be translated as to settle down, to rest, to become quiet, and consequently to rest. The verb nuah is also used in covenant contexts. Obviously, resting was extended to the entire human race, animals, and even to nature. God himself rested on the seventh day after all his work was completed. That's another instance of the word nuach. This is the only place where the verb nuach conveys the opposite of work. By implementing the verb in this unique contextual position, the author clearly intended to show that resting should come only as the finale after the completion of work. This is also evident in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, where the author employed a different verb to indicate the same result. So I guess if you uh, don't work during the week, why um, you're not keeping the, seven, the fourth commandment? Shabbat, to rest. The verb Shabbat, which is used in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, appears in the call form 27 times. In most cases, it is related to the weekly or yearly Sabbath, its basic meaning is to cease, to come to an end, and it indicates the pertinent rest and celebration of people, animals, and land. However, the full breadth of its meaning is evidenced through its wide usage in various contexts. The term is used in the covenant speech just after the flood. God promised that as long as the earth remained, that seed time, harvest, cold, and heat, summer and winter, day and night, would not cease, or Shabbat. God decrees that as long as the form of this world exists, the natural processes that carry the life of creation will never come to an end. That the promise of God's continual care will not be limited by the human condition, but will be granted unconditionally. And it's interesting to raise the question of whether when Jesus said, my father worketh and I'm still working as well, that he had reference to that precise text. In the same way, the word is used in Joshua 5.12 when manna, which was given to the people on a daily basis throughout the 40 years of the wilderness experience, ceases, Shabbat. On the same day, the people of Israel taste the produce, the produce of the land of Canaan. The period in which manna was available to them was completed and came to an end. Again, the cessation of manna was not subject to the human condition. It seems that Shabbat represents a, a cessation or a complete stoppage of a process which has been going on for a certain length of time. The provision of manna came to a conclusion and was not just temporarily interrupted. By the way, for those of you who are curious, yes, there is a linguistic connection between Shabbat and Shabbat. Uh, or Sabbath. <clears throat> Similarly, when Shabbat is used in relation to the seventh day, in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, so the noun Sabbath isn't used there, but the verb sabbatize, if you, if you want to call it that, is. It is not primarily connected to resting in order to recover, but rather indicates that a particular process is completely finished and that there is nothing else to be added to it. Every time Shabbat is used, it does not depend on any human condition for its implementation. Even though it was given to all 
creation, unfortunately, it seems that the observance of the Sabbath was unique to ancient Israel. It was not an aversion to labor, but to celebrate the cessation of a completed work. The seventh day comes as a result of the completion of a six-day cycle. And it is given as a gift from the Creator Himself. He completed His work in six days and rested, Shabbat, and He does not expect less from humankind either. Therefore, the institution of the seventh day does not simply imply a disruption of labor, but the rest has its full meaning only if the tasks set for six days have been completed. The seventh day of the week, requiring a Shabbat, represents a literal day that follows six literal days. The only reason for such a request, indicated specifically in the fourth commandment, is that God also finished his work in six days. If the miracle of creation was not finished within six literal 24-hour days, there is no foundation for the keeping of the fourth commandment. By connecting the fourth commandment to creation week, the biblical author made clear that those two are closely related. And then there's this little parenthetical almost a footnote, Exodus 31, 17, which we'll come back to later after we finish the chapter. That, uh, this gives you kind of a flavor of the approach that he's going to be using throughout the rest of the chapter. Additional creation terminology, I'm going to, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, uh, what I think are the most important parts, Rada, to dominate. The role of humanity involved filling the directive to have dominion over God's entire creation on this earth in Genesis 1.26. The verb radah is used only 25 times in the Old Testament, which complicates its appropriate understanding and has usually been translated to rule or dominate. Apart from Genesis 1.26 and 28, which used it, use it in parallel, the verb can also be found four times in Leviticus and once in Numbers. So here we are looking at the Old Test, at the Pentateuch's use of this verb. Um, the remainder of its occurrences appear elsewhere in the Old Testament. Every time Rada is used in the biblical text, its subject is a human being, a group of individuals, or a nation. By the way, uh, the little hat over the A means that this is ending with a kind of uh, with an H which is silent, but, but kind of prolongs the, the uh, vowel a little bit. Um, its object could be either human beings or the entire creation of this earth, including plants. While its etymology is uncertain, it appears that elsewhere it is mostly used in connection with royalty, and there are some examples. And as such, is associated with a variety of meanings. In addition to using the term to refer to royalty, uh, so we have an implication of royalty in the, uh, in the Genesis text. Humans are the royalty of, of life on our planet. Uh, the book of, of Numbers and Leviticus employ Radah in a different context. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. The book of Numbers uses it only once in Balaam's oracle. Here it is used as a call imperfect just, uh, jussive, the same as in Genesis 1.26. The jussive is used to, to express the speaker's desire, wish, or command, where a third person is the subject of the action. This oracle is considered to be a messianic prophecy, and therefore the subject is the Messiah himself. In this case, desire is expressed that the Messiah will rule or have dominion in this context. The word rada has a positive meaning as in his in meant to uh, convey a gentle rulership. And I'll have to say that here I diverge slightly from the text. Um, and here's why. This is the passage, and you perhaps have run into this passage, before I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and his scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and shall destroy all the children of Sheth. Uh, some of you are f familiar with the uh, star out of Jacob. Um, and Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. That sounds like somebody that's not necessarily ruling completely kindly. And then out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. There's that Radah. 
and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Somehow that just doesn't picture to me a kind, gentle dominion. Uh, I think that I think that what's happening is that theology is being read back into the into the text, and I'm not sure that I agree with it. The same word is also used four times in the book of Leviticus, but in different settings. Three times it is employed in connection with the laws of redemption involving Israelites who were sold into servitude. The law provides the same guidance, guidelines for all masters, where, whether Israelite or Gentile, and it's basically the same expression is in, this, in all four cases. Or, pardon me, in all three cases. Um, in all three cases, the author uses a call, imperfect, that's the same one we were using, well, actually, not Joseph, but in, with the negative particle, low. Um, the imperfect with negation expresses an absolute or categorical prohibition with the strongest expectation of obedience and mostly in divine commands. And if you're curious, that's the word that is used for thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and so forth. Uh, so when they say the strongest po expectation of obedience, I think that uh, that gives you some context for that. Uh, in all cases, rada is followed by the noun perek, meaning harshness or severity. Since in all cases a strong prohibition is issued, the masters are prohibited to rule over their servants with any harshness. In this context, it is obvious that the word rada should be understood as a reference to some type of gentle rule. Um, here's uh, kind of the prototypical, the first one. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shall fear thy God. And uh, the rule is that rada. And of course, with rigor is that peric. One can argue that rule, or rada, is being used as a harsh rule here. It certainly is. Uh, in all three cases, rule with rigor. Um, now, one doesn't have to argue that rule must mean rule viciously or with rigor, because there could be two kinds of rule, harsh and benign, and that benign rule is being advocated. I would feel more comfortable if you could find some place where it talks about uh, the rule being benign. But the closest I can get is in Jeremiah, uh, where the prophets rule uh, in such a way that the people like it. Or I, correction, the priests rule. Actually, they rule using their money and the people like it. Um, and... So I guess there is one case where Radha can be a, uh, a gentle role, although not benign in that case. Um, uh, so I think that his interpretation is possible, but I would rather, uh, the way he writes it, it almost sounds like it has to be benign. And, and clearly the... the the uh, Pentateuch uses it in a, in a way which doesn't seem to be benign. And the word rada appears for the last time in the Pentateuch in Leviticus 26.17 in the context of covenant making. It is mentioned in the curses section as a caution against disobedience. If the people decided to follow foreign gods, they would not be able to stand against their enemies. A grim warning was issued to the people of Israel with the consequence that those who hate you shall rule over you. In this context, it is obvious that the word rada occupies a very important place. Certainly in this context, it points to a different, harsher type of rulership. Well, actually similar, harsher type of rulership, I think. But, uh, However, this punishment is issued as the first step for insubordination and is considered to be the mildest one. Its decisive role in a covenant context does not necessarily imply slavery, which will come as the last resort for the stubborn nation. Um, Leviticus 26, 14 through 39 includes effectively six steps whereby God's power and might are exercised in order to bring his disobedient people back to himself. 
And by the way, this text has a very interesting relationship to the Qumran Dead Sea Scroll um, of Leviticus in cave 11. Um, the, the divine disciplinary actions show a gradual intensification resulting eventually in exile. The exile is used here as the last resort and as such is placed at the end of the list. Following this line of argument, it is obvious that the first step will be the mildest one. Since the word rada appears in the context of step number one, it should not be understood as cruel slavery-like domination by Israel's enemies, but rather as a more general indication that other nations will be more successful in everything, including battle, and will dominate Israel. Although, sure, I mean, I can follow what he's saying, but it, uh, rada does not sound like a good thing here. Let's just put it that way. Bearing all this, uh, bringing all this to bear in the creation account, we have a clear understanding of the role God gave to the first humans. The author employed the word rada skillfully in order to bring into focus two important elements, the title or office of the first human beings and two, their obligation toward those who are placed under their care. I, I think that that comes better when you look at the word ebed or abad, which we're going to come into I, I, I think that what's happening is that uh, it's being read, uh, it's being read positively, and the negative implications are being kind of ignored, uh, rather than met and dealt with. As noted earlier, the word is closely connected to royalty, and as such, highlights the royal status of the first humans. Their masters and all creation is placed under their care and stewardship. As Rada indicates, their dominion, or their domination must be administered with kindness, care, and compassion um, for those who are under their superintendence. Furthermore, Rada is used here as a bridge to connect chapters 1 and 2. The word used in Genesis 1 introduced to generically the role of humans, which is then fully explored and understood in the following chapter verses 8 and 15, and he's going to go through those in just a minute. Uh, sim, or uh, to put. Um, actually, sim. Um, the biblical author captivates the attention of his readers by introducing the Garden of Eden scene. Genesis 2.8 sim simply states, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Put being the verb seem. Interestingly, the author does not specify any justification or purpose for such an action. No explanation is provided as to the rationale of this action. He does not elaborate on this point since he already provided his readers with such information. The only previous text that deals with such material is located in Genesis 1.26 in the preceding chapter where humanity was given dominion over all creation. That's that radah. Some might suggest that the explanation of purpose is found in the following verse using sim. If I were editing, I would not say that. I would say using put. And the reason why will be obvious in just a minute. In Genesis 2.15, rather than the previous one, in Genesis 1.26, this is most unlikely for most unlikely for two reasons. First, these two verses are separated by a long description of the garden with the four rivers and everything else. And second, in spite of the fact that most English translations use the verb to put in both cases, the Hebrew text actually employs two different verbs, sim in verse 8 and nuach. Yeah, the nuach we heard about before and we're going to get that discussed in verse 15. Thus, if verses 8 and 15 are related, it should be reasonable to assume that the author would use the same verb. Now, in English, that doesn't always happen, but in Hebrew, it is quite common. Since he did not, the purpose of verse 8 is located in the previous chapter rather than following. That's the argument, and in case you're wondering, here's the three verses. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and so forth. Um, that dominion is the radah. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put, sim, the man whom he had formed. 
And then finally, verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put Noah him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Uh, sure. Um, can we pass the mic here? Just wait. It'll come on. It'll come on. In Genesis 1, when it talks about the sun, moon, and stars, it says God put them in the firmament. Is that a different Hebrew word, or is seen I would being have to used? look that up. I don't know. Uh, uh, somebody who has a... Hebrew Bible on them. Uh, what is the verse? Verse 17 or 18. Let's see if I can find it. Go ahead, but go ahead. If you get it first. Uh, it's translated, God set them in the firmament. Verse 17. Yes. And what, what is that set? Well, let's see. Uh, it's the third day, and here's the fourth day. Um, it's a heath pile of Noah. Um, yes, Nathan Elohim, Rakia. Greater than to ruin the day, less right to ruin. Word that has the same connotation. It's a his pile of Noah. I I think it's Yatain, which uh, by Yatain, which be from Natan, it's a gave. He gave them. Okay. Yeah, that could be. Thank you. But it's a his pile. Because most here have to rely on English, and when you have set and put, it seems like it's the same yeah. idea. By the way, if you have to rely on English, you can cheat. There is a BLB Classic will give you the King James text along with a notation for the Strong's Word, and it's given in H318 or H2536 or whatever it is, and uh, and so you actually can have your own little Hebrew concordance. And if you click on that letter, not only can you get the definition in Genesius, but you can also get a complete listing of all of the instances of that word in the Old Testament. And the same thing is true for the Greek New Testament. So if, if you're not a Hebrew or Greek scholar, you can actually look this stuff up. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, I guess we've, we've read those. And coming back to you, you can see, it really he should say put, because it isn't seem in both, both uh, uh, in, in 2.15. It's nuah. And it's very clear if you read the, uh, read the account. Um, and that's why I said I, I, would, I would do it differently. And uh, um, the, verb, the word sim is one of 25 words most frequently used in the Old Testament. And it appears in every Old Testament book with the exception of Jonah and Ecclesiastes. Since this word is widely used, some lexica offer more than 25 meanings and many other sub-meanings. So it means that it's highly... De uh, well, the core idea is there, I think, but the, but the uh, nuances are highly context-dependent. In such cases where a wide variety of meanings does exist for a single verb, its context always plays a crucial role in unlocking its meaning. Among the wide range of its usage, seem, uh, that should have been italicized, but is used in the context of appointing someone to an office of authority, so put in place, taskmasters, elders in the community, judges, or military commanders. It is also used in the context of setting a king upon a throne, putting a king, sim, as a symbol of rulership and an indication of power, which, of course, is kind of an implication here in the text. Deuteronomy uses the word sim four times in this sense with 
which unmistakably reflects the significance. God puts kings or kings are appointed. Furthermore, the language of appointing kings is ultimately connected to the coronation ceremony. Understanding the meaning of the word seem, in this context, again, I'm just italicizing it, it illuminates its significance in the creation account. The fact that the purpose of Genesis 2.8 is found in Genesis 1.26, where rulership and dominion over all creation was given to humanity, sheds new light on the understanding of the word seem in this context. Genesis 1.26 serves as an introduction of God's intention to address humanity's role, and Genesis 2.8 explains how it was done. God did not just put humans in the Garden of Eden as missing pieces in a puzzle or misplaced items on their rightful place in a shelf, but rather, he placed humans in the Garden in order for them to accept kingship over all creation. On the sixth day of creation, God introduced the first human beings to, uh, of, to the entire creation and performed a coronation ceremony, placing a scepter of dominion into their hands. Since only human beings were created in his image, obviously God had chosen them from among all all other living things to be granted royal status. Human beings did not come into this position because they deserved it in the first place, but because it was given to them. Whatever the verb seem is, whenever the verb seem is used in this context, its subject, God in this case, is always the one who has the requisite authority or competence to achieve the task. The one who appoints is superior to both the positions and the individuals appointed. The white ellipses are his, the yellow is mine. Nuah, to put. We're coming back to that verb again, but this is a little bit different. Uh, while Genesis 2.8 indicates the coronation of the first humans and their role as rulers, verse 15 of the same chapter informs the readers about humanity's responsibilities in this new kingly role. They were given a task in relation to the Garden of Eden, to till it and keep it. And we're going to come back to that. Again, the text, verse 15, indicates that God put him in the Garden of Eden. The author introduces an entirely new aspect of function and responsibility for human beings in their role as masters of God's creation. About the verb nuach, among its variants, the verb appears also in hiphiel, that's the causative form, with two slightly different spellings. Whenever it occurs with a single letter N, it usually means cause to settle down, give rest, bring to rest. You can see the causative aspect of that. However, when it occurs with a double N, and there are two different forms, uh, they look identical in the vowel-less Hebrew, but they are pointed with a dot in the N. And so that's a traditional pronunciation. Then it involves a different meaning, such as leave behind, referring to either person or things. In this particular form, the verb may also indicate permit to remain or leave alone, where its object might include people or things. When God placed the first couple in the Garden of Eden, he actually left them behind with a new task. The verb may also convey the notion that he placed them in charge with full authority over his entire creation on earth. God permitted them to remain in this environment as rulers or masters, not to be idle, but to till it and keep it. And we're coming to those two verbs, abad and shamar, to work and serve and to keep. And by the way, the uh, ebed, which is cognate of abad, is servant, can also mean slave. The responsibility and title that humanity received did not come without obligations and responsibility. The author employs, I would have done something with this if I were editing. The author employs two very common Hebrew verbs, abad, to till, to work. And in case you're having trouble hearing this, it is very difficult to pronounce as ah. <laughs> abad. And in English, it slurs over. In Spanish, it slurs over. Western Europe really had trouble with that. And, and in modern Hebrew in Western Europe, has the, the, the uh, letter ayin has almost completely disappeared in terms of pronunciation. Uh, and in case you're interested, 
the B-A-A-L is Baal. Uh, anyway, uh, the author employs two very common words, Abad to till and work, and Shamar to keep, in both call infinitive construct form. The simple, the standard way of writing. The verb Abad appears in the Sabbath commandment where God requires from his people to work, Abad, six days only. It may be followed by an object which is preceded by the preposition B, in, or where it is usually interpreted as to work for or to serve for instead of to work in or to serve in. The verb may appear with an inanimate object such as soil or ground, vineyards or flax. In these cases, the verb should be interpreted to work, to cultivate, to develop the ground or flax or whatever. The author of Genesis 2.15 attaches a rare third feminine singular suffix to the verb abad. The same suffix is attached to avad only one other time in Jeremiah 27.11, but not to the same inflection of the verb. While Jeremiah uses a perfect tense for his base and attaches a suffix to it, the author of Genesis 2.15 uses the infinitive construct base. So there's slight difference there. Um, in spite of the fact that most English translations, uh, most English versions translate abad in Genesis 2.15 as to work or to till, the possible meaning of servitude must not be ignored. Indeed, in such a context, it is probable that the Garden of Eden, with all it contained, was to be served by the first human being. So our dominion is not supposed to be for ourselves. It's supposed to be in service to those that we are having dominion over. Shades of Jesus, uh, the greatest of you must be your servant. Uh, this would shed new light on their role in the garden, including their royal obligations. In addition to serving God's creation in the Garden of Eden, the first couple also accepted another role, namely to keep it. Here the author employed the word shamar, which is one of the most common verbs in the Old Testament. And to skip over a little bit about how it's used in various places, when the author employs the, verb, the word shamar in Genesis 2.15, human beings are the subject and the Garden of Eden with its plant and animal life is the object. Guardianship implies stewardship which reminded Adam and Eve of the fact that Eden was not their possession but had been given to them for safekeeping. Stewardship it goes back a long ways. Protection of the garden does not imply an imperfect world surrounding it, but it, although in this case it is an imperfect world, there is a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you can be careful about that. But it refers to maintenance and even more so to the preservation of its perfection as it came out of the Creator's hands. So there's stuff to upkeep. Uh, and since Shamar carries in, in itself a notion of covenant as well, it is possible to recognize that by protecting the garden and by preserving it, humans entered into a covenant relationship with their creator and with the entire creation as well. As noted earlier, a pronominal feminine singular suffix is attached to both avad and shamar, indicating that the objects of service and protection should have the same gender and number. The most obvious candidate should be garden. However, garden is a masculine singular noun and in this capacity does not qualify for such a function. So they can't serve the garden, at least not femininely serve the garden. Since earth is a feminine noun, it is possible that the author tried to indicate that the first couple's service and protection would not always be limited only to the Garden of Eden but will gradually be extended to the entire planet Earth. In addition to Genesis 2.15, the verb shamar and abad appear as a pair only once in Numbers 8.26. Regarding this pairing, Richard M. Davidson rightly argues that the first couple received priesthood in the Garden of Eden as well. In this way, they became a royal priesthood with the clear understanding that they were stewards in his service for the good of all who inhabited the Garden of Eden. And I'd love to agree with that, but unfortunately, here's the passage. Um, read the first few verses, the 
a couple of verses before, this is the belongeth unto the Levites, from twenty and five years old and upwards, they shall go and wait upon the service. That's uh, derived from the verb uh, Abba of the tabernacle of the congregation, and from the age of fifty years old, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof, and shall serve, and that is the verb Abba, no more, but shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation. Minister is slightly different from Abba uh, to keep the charge. And there's, uh, it's, those are both the verb keep and the charge. It is to watch the watch, if you prefer, um, and shall do no service. And again, that's shall, avad no evet, avadah, I believe it is. It's, uh, it's uh, the same, this is the verb and that's the noun for avad. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites touching their charge. And I have two comments on it. One of them is that, yes, the two verbs are close to each other, kind of, but it's not exactly like serve and keep are, are together parallel. They're, in this particular case, kind of anti-parallel. And the second thing, which is, bothers me more, is that this is talking about the Levites, not the priests. So I suppose you could say that they have a Levitical job, but not really, at least using this text, not really a priestly job. Then he goes on to kana, to acquire and possess. And interestingly enough, this verb is not found in Genesis 1 and 2, um, but will be found later in the expression creator of heaven and earth. And uh, so Melchizedek, king of Salem, blessed Abraham after his victory over Chedor Laomer and the other three kings from the east and the rescue of his nephew Lot and his family. You may remember the story in Genesis 14. In Melchizedek's blessing, the reference to maker of heaven and earth, verse 9, is the same phrase used in Abraham's response in verse 22, maker of heaven and earth, in spite of the fact that one might expect to see the words Ose or Ose, corresponding to Asa, to make, or perhaps Bara, to create. You don't actually see those, either one of those, um, which are the most common words in denoting maker. Both Melchizedek and Abraham rather implied the word Kana here. Uh, that Q is pronounced de deep in the throat, and I'm not always getting it right. Uh, kana. And skip over a little bit the verb, uh, other references in the Old Testament. The verb, kana, may also re refer to begetting a child, whether literally or symbolically. In this context, the verb is used only four times in the Old Testament. One of those, out of those four occurrences, only Genesis 4.1 refers to a literal meaning when Eve declared that she begot her firstborn, Cain. And I put that in because it's interesting that Cain is actually Cain. And it's related to the verb kana. And skipping over a lot of that because it's not actually in Genesis 1 or 2. Um, then it discusses rahap to move and tohu. In tohu wabohu, you may remember, formless. The verb rahap is used only three times in the entire Old Testament. Apart from Genesis 1-2, it appears in Deuteronomy 32-11 and Jeremiah 23-9. Due to its rare occurrence, its etymology is uncertain, but according to most lexicons, it has two distinct meanings. And that should be uh, uh, footnote 46. It appears only once in the call in Jeremiah 23-9, where it means to grow soft, relax, shake, tremble. Twice it is used in the PL, which is a, an enforced, uh, reinforced meaning. And then it means to hover, move, or flutter. Interestingly, Deuteronomy 32.11 uses the words rahaf and tohu in the same context, which is also the case in Genesis 1.2. Both words appear in the Pentateuch only twice, and both in times in close proximity to each other. The author of Genesis 
uh, pardon me, of Deuteronomy 32.11, uses the word Rahab in Moses' song, where God is the subject and Jacob is the object. Here God is pictured caring for Jacob, who serves as a synonym for Israel, as an eagle who, Rahab, flutters, hovers over its youngsters. In this context, it is clear that the word, that the verb Rahab should be understood as a gesture of tenderheartedness that manifests deep motherly feelings of love and care. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, and in a waste howling wilderness, that waste is uh, tohu. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttering, fluttereth over her young, that's Rahaf, uh, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. And uh, that's as far as I've gone with that passage. And um, again, I, I, I think what's uh, that it's kind of a reach to to push Rahaf and uh, uh, and Tohu together right there. Um, the context is enough different that I'm not sure that I can make a make as tight a connection as uh, Gordon seems to be doing. Uh, and then. This is a part I'd love to see expanded. Phyllis A. Bird stated correctly that canonically the understanding of human nature expressed or implied in the laws, that's the laws of Moses, may be viewed as commentary on the creation texts. The idea that the law comes from creation would be really nice to have fleshed out if you're trying to show that creation is the foundation of the Pentateuch, which is what we're talking about. S. Dean McBride touched on some of the material, while Jerry Moscala demonstrated that the distinction between clean and unclean animals found in Leviticus 1 has an obvious connection to Genesis 1 and 2. I'd love to see more in the chapter on that. Uh, furthermore, A. Bregia also convincingly argued that sexual, dietary, and Sabbath laws, as explained in the Pentateuch, have their roots in the creation story. Again, I'd love to see that expanded. Uh, maybe we should get somebody to do that one of these days. Uh, conclusion, this study has clearly demonstrated that the author of the Pentateuch was extremely careful and selective in his choice of certain words in order to demonstrate certain important issues and effects of God's power of creation. It is reasonable to argue that the intention of the author was to indicate God's parental love right from the beginning as the driving force that resulted in the perfect creation of this planet and everything contained in it. Most obviously, humanity was given a distinctive role and function. As has been argued, God intended that the first humans were to responsibly rule over the entire creation, knowing that they were accountable to their creator for their actions. With this understanding, they accepted their royal role of protecting and preserving the Garden of Eden by rendering service to the entire creation. Furthermore, they received the gift of the Sabbath, which provided a covenantal rest as a perpetual sign of the Creator's authority and ownership as suzerain king. And of course, that refers to Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Now, my take on this, that concludes the chapter, by the way. Um, my take on this, I was kind of a little bit disappointed in this chapter. It certainly isn't argued with the same tightness and uh, uh, and what I think is even-handedness as the uh, ch chapter on Genesis uh, 1 and 2 was. Uh, the theme seems to be a word study loosely based on Genesis 1 and 2 with Kana not even being used in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, I don't fully trust the exegesis as it seems to me to be theologically biased, although I don't disagree with the end result. Um, I'd like to be able to build things from a little more solid uh, basis. There were hints of relationships between the creation account and some aspects of the Pentateuch that I think could have been explored more. 
the excuse that was made is somebody else has already done it, but even if they have a, a few short paragraphs explaining that would have been, in my opinion, welcome. Uh, in particular, I think that Exodus 31, 16 through 18 should be more prominent. Exodus 31, 16 through 18 disappeared into the parenthetical note at the end of Exodus 20. And the reason it's important is because there are those who vigorously try to argue that Deuteronomy 5 was the original and that Exodus uh, 20 was the copy and that therefore there's no reference to the creation in the Pentateuch and that's just wrong because Exodus 31, 16 through 18 exists and to quote from the good old king, Therefore, the, uh, wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him on Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Obviously, this passage is connected to the Ten Commandments. And obviously, uh, it's reinforcing the Fourth Commandment reason. And even if you get rid of the Fourth Commandment, you still have this leftover that you haven't dealt with, that the Pentateuch does assume the existence of Genesis 1 and 2, and particularly in Genesis 1. And uh, uh, there's one other thing that I think should have been discussed because for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And of course, the fourth commandment goes on to say the sea and all that in them is. But you may remember that the heaven and earth uh, here count as a dyad. And that almost implies that he made everything. And it would be, I, I would like at least some discussion on that um, before we just move on. But uh, that's my opinion, and it's now your turn. We have a comment over here. Usually I defer to someone else to start the discussion. <laughs> anyway, um, maybe you can comment on the structure of Genesis 1 and how it might relate to today's word study. You have first three days, God making the, you know, the foundation pattern. And the next three days, God filling the entities with actual either entities or beings like um, animals, plants, and so on. So you have um, three plus three, and then with the last three, it's fourth day, you start out with God giving rulership to the sun, moon, and stars. And then the sixth day, the last of the groups of three, God establishing rulership of humans. Right. Is there any connection between rulership of sun, moon, and stars and rulership given to Adam and Eve? There, there's uh, an obvious structural connection. Yes, uh, actually that's interesting because I looked that up to be sure. And uh, the rulership that the sun and moon and stars exhibit is uh, Mashal. And the rulership that uh, Adam and Eve exhibit is Radha. I guess if I was being real technical, it would be Radha. Because um, they tap their R's as near as I can tell. But I can say using two different verbs because they're not ruling in the same way. You have inanimate rulership in the fourth day. You have animate rulership in the sixth day. So... It would just be wise, I would think, to use two different verbs and not the same verb. Well, the thing of it is that it would have been easily understood if they had used either Mashal or Radha yeah, uh, so. both the times. And 
in the Hebrew of, the, of Genesis 1, one of the striking things is that, uh, that you have repeated verbs or repeated noun and verbs uh, all throughout it. When the, when the grass is describing it, it's let shoots shoot up. Um, and, you know, in the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and morning, well, actually day one, to be precise. The evening and morning were a second day. The evening and morning were the third day. The evening and morning were the fourth day. Those are identical verbiage. Hebrews 1 turns out to be an extremely good introduction to teach people about learning to read Hebrew. I've actually used it that way. Um, and because, because the, the words keep repeating all the time. And so if you really, you know, if it, it would have been artful to use the same word if they meant the same thing. So I think that, the, that you have to make a little distinction between the mashal that the sun and moon uh, rule and the, uh, and the rada with which people rule. I agree with you that Genesis 1 is an excellent place to start studying Hebrew. I took my Hebrew grammar class from Dr. Running, and then I took exegesis of Hebrew the Pentateuch, and we always started with Genesis 1. That's, that's by far the best place to start. The verbs are, as you pointed out, they're fairly common. You can tie them in with the rest of the Old Testament. You don't have a lot of rare terms, if any, in Genesis 1 to the early verses of chapter 2. You know what it reminds me of is the Gospel of John or, or the Epistle of 1 John in, in Greek. It's that same kind of polished simplicity that just... And there's a beauty and forcefulness in that. Uh, just one more comment, and I'd like to hear from some, some others here. Uh, the theme of, the theological theme of the whole chapter, Genesis 1, is rulership. One of the themes. There's many mm -hmm. themes. Uh, it has a kingly or a royal function. It was pointed out here, and that's true. Even the first few words, in the beginning... God created. Um, in the beginning is used in two or three other places. And she's in, in the beginning of the reign of so -and -so. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, in the beginning of the reign of one of the other kings, Jehoiakim, I think. So, and, and it's that same Bereshit? Yes, it's Bereshit. Yeah. And with a construct uh, afterwards, in the beginning mm -hmm. of the reign. So it has a construct right after. So it sets the tone right from the very first um, few words of a royal theme. Anyway. Other comments or questions? We have one in the back here. I've got to go pretty quick, but I, I listened to all this and I'm wondering, how does this fit in to our idea of creation week, uh, six literal days? Uh, I'm getting lost in all the verbiage because I know nothing about that. <laughs> and I can see theologians arguing about things based on just this kind of thing. Uh, so the bottom line, does this, uh, it depends on where someone's coming from where they're going to take the language, it seems to me. That is, and, uh, that is unfortunately true. And, and it, so and I, it's exhibited by the author of this, uh, this article. I, I think got a little over-enthusiastic in yeah, some Yeah, I places. understood that part, actually. So. <laughs> but uh, my thing, it would be good to know where someone's coming from when they try to make a point. Well, you know I, I think you're right. And I think there's another point, too, and that is that it's good to know where the biblical writer is coming from. And that's why we read the Bible, is to try to find out where it's coming from. Presumably, those of us who accept it will try to come from the same general place. Um, and that's why I think that uh, Exodus 31 deserves so much more attention than what it was given. Because 
I, it, it's one of the two places where creation is specifically referred to, not kind of in sanctuary imagery or stuff like that, which I think exists, and I think it's important, but I think that, that, that where it's explicit is even more important. Yes. I have a comment down here. By the way, it is 11.30. I know some of you need to be uh, elsewhere. So It's very easy to get uh, sidetracked into details. Uh, I think the issue that we face here uh, is the fact that the majority of the Christian world uh, feels that God created over long periods of time and uh, it was not a recent creation, or necessarily a six-day creation, but it was, uh, and that is not so, so important type of thing. And I, I think, uh, you know, well, it still preserves your God, and you still have uh, uh, some deity there to do things, and uh, the usual uh, dichotomy we have here between science and the Bible, uh, is probably not as severe in the Christian world as the uh, dichotomy between are, are we going to believe in a recent creation or are we going to believe in a creation over long periods of time and Genesis 1 to 11 is often referred to as allegorical and you, except the rest of the Bible. Uh, I would uh, simply point out here that uh, as you move into long ages for life and uh, there's a significant part of our church that uh, is pushing in that direction. Uh, you face the challenge of uh, God's integrity in the, exactly Exodus 20 and 38, uh, I 31, uh, that uh, it would be a strange kind of God who would create over millions of years and then he comes to Sinai and tells, hey keep my Sabbath because I did it in six days. Uh, this makes no sense. Uh, he could give us all kinds of reasons to keep the Sabbath. And has in some cases. He has in some cases but uh, there he emphasized it and he wrote it with his fingers. The most authoritative words we have in there is that he did it in, in, in six days. So what are we doing to God uh, when we start talking about life having been here over billions of years, uh, millions of years and so on, uh, in the context, especially in the context of the Sabbath? It, it doesn't work. <laughs> There's a lot more we could say. I want to answer this gentleman's question who had to leave unfortunately and that's this has a very practical value in dealing with modern um, schemes of harmonization for example the gap theory we can test the gap theory with these word studies and I think the gap theory comes up wanting now for some of you that are a little hazy on that, well, it's the idea that... Which, just, gap, which gap are you talking about? Um, both Act, gaps. Active gap or passive? <laughs> uh, Genesis 1-2 um, indicates there's a period of without form and void and doesn't say where, where or when how that they is. Came, how that got there, but it, yeah. but it does say, and the earth was, and it, instead of saying, and the earth became, which would exactly. left I a lot that. more room. It already was. It was incomplete. Now, when you talk about rulership, if that's a theme of the chapter, then when it says in the beginning as a theme, it doesn't make sense to have millions and millions of years of gap there in God's rulership. Because if you look at the whole Old Testament, when, there, when there's gaps and there's no king on the throne or, or gap in rulership, uh, that's bad news for the history of Israel. 
And if we, in the gap theory, if we put God's rulership beginning millions of years ago and then have this without form and void as a gap, and then all of a sudden we have the rulership theme pick up on the fourth day and then the sixth day, it seems like it doesn't fit very well with either gap theory, but especially the gap theory with um, life and human and pre-humans and animals and plants and everything. So I'd like to maybe hear a few thoughts on how this word study might apply to the gap theory. Well, this particular word study doesn't apply because it didn't it didn't go into. Uh, it would be very interesting to go out and um, and and look at and look at uh, occurrences of Haya. At, uh, and go back and see whether, uh, and, and I'm thinking specifically not uh, 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 let's see, I think it's Yehia, the uh, the Joseph or the or the um, uh, uh, well consecutive imperfect, which turns into perfect. Um, but because because the rest of the passage does use that, but it but in verse two it specifically does not use that, exactly. and uh, it would be very interesting to see what happened when uh, haya or when other verbs are used in that same kind of uh, non-consecutive, uh, and and. That would have made a nice capstone to to Davidson's uh, article. Uh, maybe maybe one of us should should do one of those word studies. It's not that hard because the because the uh, like I say you can find the verbs in the Hebrew uh, all nicely correlated for you in um, in the Blue Letter Bible. This book was prepared by a Faith and Science Council. Correct. What's that? Where did it come? I was just trying to find some information, and there's nothing really there in the book. Um, and how did they choose them? Did they meet? Did they? What did they do? It's, well, well, okay, I'm. I'm. Do you I, know more than I do? Well, I don't know much more than you do, but I will make some educated guesses. <laughs> That's probably the best. <laughs> okay. Near as I can tell, what happened was that they decided they needed a scholarly work that would go through the Old Testament uh, uh, and looking at creation. And so what they did was they took people who were knowledgeable about various topics. Gregor is in archaeology. Um, who would, uh, most of the time... Most of these, if you, if you read them, you turn out that they have written on this already. So they came partly primed. And, and so th what they've basically done is they have collected kind of all of the scholarly work that has to do with Genesis 1 and 2 and tried to put it together into one volume. And, and the theme is Genesis 1 and 2 in the rest of the Old Testament, except for chapter 3, which is, of course, Genesis 1 and 2 itself, which make, made a great introduction, I think. Um, chapters 1 and 2 were written <coughs> as kind of... Um, uh, polemics against, defenses against, however you want to put that... Um, or apologetics for the traditional view against common claims of the of the uh, of the kind of what I might call the standard historical critical uh, method. Uh, one of them one of them claiming that this all is just a derivation of ancient Near Eastern stuff, and that um, uh, Hazel had written. Um, Gerhard Hasel had written a, a really nice work that one of his sons, I think it was Michael, I, it was Michael, um, updated to say, no, this isn't a derivation from ancient, other ancient Near Eastern. Uh, if anything, it's a polemic against them 
and it needs to be taken on its own face value rather than trying to interpret it as going along with all of the rest of the ancient Near Eastern cosmologies because it's distinctly different. The second one is the charge that the Rakia was a uh, beaten out metal dome that, and it, you know, that's a very popular uh, uh, construct as witnessed by the fact we had two people in our Sabbath school arguing that point. Um, they weren't coming up from it, uh, you know, on their own scholarship. They're actually um, reflectors of other men's thoughts and not mere think. Um, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, but anyway, they. Uh, but it is the common, uh, the common argument, and it's an argument that that allows people to say, well, you know, the Genesis people were really uninformed. And the information they had all came from their society, and therefore we don't really have to pay attention to it. So those first two chapters are actually kind of defenses against a standard historical critical criticism of Genesis 1 and 2. And then the rest of the book is, here's what Genesis 1 and 2 says. Here's what the rest of the Pentateuch says. And like I said, I, I think that chapter in my opinion, could have been written a little better. Um, but, you know, I think that some of the other ones will be better than this. Maybe not quite as good as Davidson, because Davidson is just masterful. I, like I said, I had, I had trouble finding anything I could omit. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and in fact, the number five is going to be Psalm 104, which uh, Davidson uh, also has written on. And then what they did was they basically did, they divvied it up among scholars who uh, had expertise in the area and who, in their opinion, were faithful to the biblical record. Uh, and, then, um, and then, so we're going to run into other Psalms, we're going to run into the wisdom literature, we're going to run into, and we're going to see that creation is not just an isolated 11 chapters that you can kind of cut off of the Bible, start your Bible at Genesis 12 and you're fine. That it actually follows through all of the Old Testament and for what it's worth there's another book in the works with the same general intention that is going to take creation in the New Testament. So that when you get done you're going to have two companion volumes that will talk about creation and its foundational relationship to the entire Bible. And of course, you know, in the New Testament we're going to talk about Adam and, uh, 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 you know, Adam and Christ and the, the second Adam and, and, you know, through one man sin entered the world and then, uh, uh, you know, references to Adam and Eve. Uh, yeah, male and female and Jesus comments. Uh, so all of those kinds of things will be collected and the combined weight, the intention of that is that you can't cut off creation from the rest of the Bible. That if you didn't have Genesis 1 through 12, you would know that it was missing. That's something that you're, you know, that you're not getting the whole story. And in fact, certain key aspects of it can be derived from Exodus, for example, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. It doesn't say exactly which ones and how, and you know, that there are three forming and three filling kind of things. Um, but what you can say is that it did take six days. And it was intended to be six literal, uh, for want of a better expression, 24 hour days. I prefer you to more days. Your battery is not. Oh, right. Not talking. Uh, we have we don't have another one down here. So. Time to go. Okay, and then I guess we'll just have to pass the other one around. I hope this one isn't dead. Um, I think we've got it now. Oh, not yet. This one. Testing. One, two. Testing. It's two. Is that one dead too? Well, that one's working. We may have to just pass the mic. Okay. There, that's better. Um,
But so the intention is to have a complete biblical um, survey on creation. And then when you get done, um, what can be said will have been said. And their intention is not to have this be a moneymaker, although I, you know, I suppose every publishing house around would like to have it make it be a moneymaker anyway, but they, but they are distributing it for free in all of the uh, important uh, uh, universities that they can think of. So uh, there's, there's one here at Loma Linda, but there will also be ones in UCLA and, and Berkeley and uh, uh, Stanford, you know, those kinds of places. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so they're, they're, they're not trying to sell them to these places. They're giving them away, which I think is, uh, you know, Monetarily short-sighted in the short run, but I think it's in the long run, it's actually valuable. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, the prices that they're, that they're charging are, from what I understand, not all that expensive. And the the intention is not to not to squeeze as much money out of it it's, as it is to get out the word, so to speak. Does that kind of answer your question? I think I'll write Gerald and ask him a few questions and bring him back to Sabbath school next time. And then be sure and let us know what the answer is. <laughs> good, good. I, I think he'll answer. Um, now, a lot of this really fascinates me. It may not be quite as fascinating to those that um, don't care for the nitty-gritty of all the nuances of the Hebrew language, but uh, you correctly mentioned that there's a form of the verb that it's written in the imperfect, which usually is the opposite of perfect, but when it has a wow in front of it, it becomes perfect, and it's used in narration. Without going much further into that, we have a lot of that in Genesis 1, even as much in Genesis 2 as Genesis 1, if you list all the verbs. A new book has come out that sheds light on the use of the imperfect in the entire Old Testament. It's called the chronology of the flood. One of the issues that we're not dealing with here because we're dealing with Genesis 1 and 2 is do you follow the flood narrative absolutely chronologically? And if so, you have a little discrepancy. You have the rains for 40 days and 40 nights, but you still have the rain being cut off and the flood fountains of the deep being cut off after 150 days. And what they're grappling with in that book is whether Genesis 6 through 9 is absolutely chronological. Preliminary results are that there are many, many exceptions to an exact chronological sequence. This sheds light on what we discussed about two weeks ago, about, or maybe it's three weeks now, Genesis 2, where you don't have the correct order based on Genesis 1. You have man being created before garden, before trees and plants. And then you have beasts and birds being created before woman and it seems to be all out of order. Now, if this is uh, true that the imperfect doesn't always denote correct order, there's no problem. The ancient Hebrews would not see a problem in Genesis 3, or Genesis 2, so we don't have to say, and God had created the birds and the animals before he created Eve. We don't have to use the pluperfect had, but we can just stick with the narrative as it is. So this is volume one of a th proposed three-volume set, all done by creationists. And they're going to really ferret out the, all the meanings of the flood narrative. It'll shed light on flood models and all kinds of issues that some of us have. Now, by creationists, you mean short-age creationists? Yeah, yeah, and, and the reason the reason that the reason that I'm that I'm interested in that is because um, people have to believe that the answer could be 
in a certain range before they'll accept that it is in a certain range. And uh, by the way, regarding the pluperfect, uh, you will notice that uh, God put the man in the garden which he made. And I believe he made is, um, well, so you have an example of a verb that is being used in, in the... Uh, in the perfect form, which is the standard, but uh, but it clearly meaning pluperfect in this case, because it's a God that put the man in the garden, which in English we would say he had made. Yeah. Well, maybe since we're down to one mic, we should quit before we lose it completely. <laughs> and we'll see you again next week.